Great. Thanks very much. Um, it's uh, a real privilege to be asked to come and speak to you this morning. And um, I hope that uh, what you're going to hear next in the next 45 minutes or so will be uh, something that you can connect to your, to your own work. Um, I was supposed to have been speaking at last year's conference in Vancouver, but unfortunately fell sick. And then I was on my way here and then uh, hit some airplane problems. So I was beginning to think somebody didn't want me to get here. But I'm here and I'm delighted to be here. Uh, and it's, it's, uh, I'm very grateful for the chance to speak with you all. Um, uh, as you'll see on the, on the slide there, if you're a Twitter person, then go to hash media keynote, Ed Media Keynote, and you'll see a little question there that I've put there, um, which is just to see if we can crowdsource a few words and associations that you have when you think, when somebody says the words big data and learning analytics, what words spring to mind? And I'll keep an eye on, on the, uh, the, uh, the channel there. Right, well, here's my, here's my learning objective for you today. Um, I hope that you're going to leave with an expanded vision of what analytics might be about uh, and better questions to ask in your next learning analytics conversation with somebody or perhaps when a vendor pitches up and starts dazzling you with dashboards um, and says, look, finally you can see what your students are doing and whether people are learning. So I'm going to take quite a, a critical stance uh, today. This is not going to be a big data rah-rah talk. Um, there's plenty of that around, and you can find those anywhere you'd like to go. Um, we're going to take quite a critical stance and look at what's going on in learning analytics at the moment. Um, a quick update on big data. It's basically teenage sex. Everybody's talking about it. Nobody really quite knows how to do it. Everyone thinks everyone else is doing it, and so everyone says they're doing it. Um, and there's a, there's a huge amount of hype and hyperbole around big data in general. And it's beginning to sort of impact the, uh, the education sector. Um, I'm not actually going to talk very much about big data because I don't know if education actually has big data in the sense that other sectors have. But I am going to be talking about computational data and the ability to trace what learners are doing uh, in a finer and finer granularity but also wonder what that means and, and try and engage with some of the critiques that people are raising about this. Now, when people announce that they're going to use some kind of modeling or predictive technique in other sectors, for example, our own UK Chancellor of the Exchequer announced that he was going to use dynamic scoring as a way of predicting economic futures. We, it was immediately met with um, appropriate queries about the limitations of the model. So here we have the Guardian saying, watch out for George Osborne's dynamic scoring wheeze. Here we have the Financial Times saying, Osborne courts the right with dynamic scoring. And I lifted out a quote here. And without even worrying about what dynamic scoring is, okay, but it claims to estimate the full effects of any tax change. It's controversial in the UK and the US where it's backed by right-wing publications. Few disagree that the idea is good in principle, but many economists worry about the assumption used, that they're too optimistic. And so these are exactly the kinds of questions we would ask of any predictive model that said, I've got a picture of the world and I'm going to tell you how it might unfold in the future. And of course, this is exactly the kind of mind that we should bring to analytics, particularly predictive analytics. We'll talk a little bit in a moment about those. I was uh, speaking uh, not long ago at uh, the, the Code Acts in Education event. Um, this was uh, held in the UK. You can find it there. And all my slides will be on my blog later on, so don't worry if you miss any links or references. Um, Code Acts in Education was all about how is software shaping education. And they asked me to come along and talk specifically about learning analytics. And so I, I, I was uh, on the bus and I, I wanted to find the website. I thought I'd test Siri out. So I said to Siri, find Kodaks in education. Searching the web for code accident education. <laughs> and that really sums it up. What we're here trying to figure out is whether 
the particular kinds of code and analytics that we encounter in learning analytics are going to create an accident in education rather than actually enhance and augment what we consider to be the highest forms of learning. Okay. So with Code's um, rich insights in mind, um, I ran a panel at the, the Learning Analytics Conference um, called Educational Data Scientists, a Scarce Breed. John Behrens from Pearson, who runs the Digital Analytics Lab there, he, he, had, a, he had a great uh, contribution. He said, things that make me crazy. His data analyst shows him an amazing visualization. Looks, and John says, looks great at a high level. How have you explored it and tested the assumptions? Analyst says, what assumptions? And John used this as a nice example of, this is the difference between a data technician and a data scientist. A data scientist is aware that whatever they bring, computational tools, there are assumptions embedded. In fact, what I'm going to argue is there are, there are worldviews embedded, there is an epistemology and pedagogy embedded in analytics. And we have to walk into that with our eyes wide open. Um, not scared of it, but eyes wide open. A great um, image here, tweeted. Um, my Dutch is no good, but it says, check the huge difference between knowing and measuring. So the fear amongst those who are skeptics um, of analytics technology is that we'll have a reductionist, lowest common denominator, what uh, Gardner Campbell calls wall martification of higher education effect. All right. Here is the tool that every bean counter, accountant, and optimizer of efficiency ever dreamed of. We can now count more things than we could ever dream of counting. And, and, um, and what happens when the educator's performance um, appraisal is now tied to their analytics? What happens when your pay rise is tied to the graphs and visualizations coming out of your learning management system? That's a potential future. Might be considered a disastrous future. On the other hand, if you believe those analytics actually reflected what you cared about as an educator, then you might be quite pleased to be judged on those bases. That is the question. That is the question for analytics now. It's one of integrity. It's one of trust, just like any technology. So before I go any further, I won't assume that you all know what I'm talking about. So let me just give you a few examples. I'm going to flash examples in front of you at various points. And of course, behind every example, there are demos, movies, research papers that you can follow up on, which will be on, uh, on my website after this talk. So you just Google learning analytics dashboard and bring up the images page, and there you are. It sort of washes over you. You can't buy a learning environment now without some kind of dashboard. Right? Um, but the concept is out of the labs and it's into the products, okay? which is a, a significant move in learning technology. It's not just something that academics talk about anymore. You will, you will hit this when every VLE vendor rolls up uh, at your doorstep. Uh, the question, of course, is uh, what are we measuring? Um, some of the most impressive results from learning analytics are coming out of the adaptive systems, intelligent tutoring environments. Been around for a long time, of course, in academia, but they are now coming out of the lab and are out there with major platforms like Newton attracting huge investment and interest. So the Carnegie Mellon team have demonstrated that their stats tutor, which adapts itself to, to what you are doing and the mistakes you're making, Students who were using this in combination with a blended mode of delivery learned a full semester's worth of material in half as much time and did better than students learning in a conventional way. That's an impressive result, you know, and you can go read the journal paper for the details. Here we have predictive modeling, which is trying to spot which students are at risk. So at Purdue University, when you log, log into Blackboard there, I think it's still Blackboard they're using, but the actual technology is now um, um, available for, for several different platforms. <clears throat> you, the student, see a red, amber, or green light. It's a traffic light that gives you an indication of your progress. It's based on a predictive model that's running all the time based on what you're doing. Okay? The predictive model was the subject of John Campbell's PhD. 
trying to statistically validate a model of how can we correlate the students who ended up dropping out of a course with what they did during the course online. And so he, there you have the, the statistical model. You take their grade scores, their average, their usage of the course management system on several different aspects. And lo and behold, he could predict with quite impressive accuracy how many students were going to drop out. And, 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 that, and there's been quite a lot of sub subsequent work. And interestingly, students who experience this, this, this course signal system, as they call it, subsequently, when they took courses that didn't have the course signal system, it turned out that they were seeking out help resources of their own volition at a higher rate than other students. So it's like they had been learning metacognitive techniques, because when you get your amber light, it also suggests things you might want to do to improve your learning to learn abilities um, and so forth. So the argument was they're picking up good learning habits by getting this kind of timely feedback. Here's a very different example. It's from the last Learning Analytics Conference. Um, here, we're using an algorithm to do the equivalent of spot the clusters in sticky notes. So students organize ideas with electronic sticky notes on their screen into clusters. Here are the affinity groups that I see. All the students share them. An algorithm then tries to calculate what are the emerging aggregate clusters, feeds that back to the teacher, who then can catalyze a discussion based on it. Okay? So no one's trying to score anybody. No one's trying to predict students dropping out. We're simply using an algorithm to try and aggregate many different perspectives and produce a view to provoke a conversation. So you might say slightly less scary than trusting an algorithm to predict who's failing or to uh, or try and mark somebody. But it's just to give you a different example. And here's another example from the last Learning Analytics Conference from um, a team in uh, Japan. Students are out on field, field trips doing um, um, inspections of nature, and they're looking at the postures that they're using. And, and you know, just to stretch your imaginations, you know, if you have done the whole tour of the wood and you never looked up, that's important because you couldn't possibly have done certain things. So now we're into the realm of augmented, instrumented, pervasive computing, picking up posture as an indicator of what's going on. Okay. So it's just to stretch your imaginations on that front. Now, if this was a longer tutorial, there'd be many, many more examples to give you. Discourse analytics, I'll tell you a little bit more about that, where we are trying to um, assess the quality of online contributions. So much of online learning is visible through conversation. Social network analytics, using graph analytics techniques to assess the strength of social ties, the topics that people are talking about in those ties. Um, very interesting work in serious gaming. Um, so, for example, David Williamson Schaffer at University of Wisconsin-Madison has an approach to assessing the degree to which students are behaving like professionals in authentic learning scenarios. Um, and then there's a lot of work around visualization, for example, from Eric Duval and his group at Leuven, uh, using visualizations to try and just make visible patterns of use over time. Abelardo Pardo at Sydney, very interesting approach there as well, to tracking which tools are people using when, when they're engaged in a project, by installing a virtual machine on the student's desktop. OK, so some of my other talks go into these in more time. But what I'm trying to do today is, is spend a bit more time on the sort of um, stepping back from these specific examples and asking what's going on here. So people are getting very excited about analytics. There's certainly a lot of interest in trying to predict student dropout and improve retention for all the obvious reasons. Institutions are interested in that. Um, but people are also asking, what kinds of learning are we really able to track with these technologies? So Neil Selwyn, uh, bringing a sociological perspective. Observing, measuring, describing, categorizing, classifying, sorting, ordering, and ranking. These are processes of meaning making, and they're never neutral, objective, or automated, but they're fraught with problems and compromises, biases, and omissions. Evgeny Morozov, um, with, um, in his usual um, flamboyant, uh, provocative style, his latest book, To Save Everything, Click Here. Um, a pretty acerbic critique of the Silicon Valley, we can fix it mentality. Um, uh, touches on education in his book. Um, 
um, and, and complains that we have a flight from thinking and the urge to replace human judgments with timeless truths produced by algorithms. This is the underlying driving force of what he calls technological solutionism, where technology and its inventors almost invent problems for technology to solve, which, um, which perhaps aren't even really problems. So Morozov would not be very happy sitting in the audience today, I suspect. But if Morozov was here, I'm hoping that some of the things I'll show you might calm some of those concerns. I'm just dropping this in. This is slightly left field, but... What Morozov argues is we need to move from a sort of numeric calculating mind to, to something different. Uh, you might call it narrative mind. Um, others call it contemplative mind. So I'll just point you to Alex Pang. You go to contemplativecomputing.org. And he's written about the need for technology to not just accelerate life, but help us stop and pause and create peace and quiet in life as well. And if you're interested in this, um, there are a couple of links at the bottom to some blog posts about how this might connect to learning. So here, I'm trying to move into some of the different modes of thinking that academics care about, other than just uh, accelerated counting of stuff, which is what causes so many concerns. So what is the core question for learning analytics? You might summarize it like this. Can we tell from your digital profile if you're learning? Yeah. That, in essence, is, is one way of summing up what we're trying to do here. So let's unpack that a little bit. Can we tell? Well, who? Who are we talking about? The administrator of the university trying to save money? The educator who cares deeply about whether you succeed or not? Or perhaps just cares about whether you're going to get over the threshold because that's what he's being judged by? Or the learner? Is the learner seeing their own analytics? How are we going to tell? With what confidence? Am I going to be able to read and write these representations? These, these visualizations, these dashboards, can I, can I interpret those appropriately? What is this digital profile? Where is it, where's the data come from? Um, as Selwyn has pointed out, you know, what's been dropped out? What assumptions have been made in sourcing that data? And what kind of learning are we talking about? Just the few examples I've shown you show you that we're talking about many, many different kinds of learning. And so learning analytics covers many sins, if you will. And, and we have to be very clear what we're talking about when we start talking about data and analytics. And, and, and the big point here made by Gay and Pryk is that in the world of economics, um, it's, it's widely recognizing, rec recognized that, when, that accounting tools shape the reality they measure. And of course, this makes perfect sense. As soon as we start to be, as soon as we are exposed to high stakes, performance indicators, we have to make ourselves visible or we become ignored and there will be consequences. Right? We change our behavior to maintain our visibility to those we care about being visible to. And if learning analytics start to become more and more pervasive, this is how people will be seeing learning. So the question then is, well, in what senses do analytics actually shape the reality that they measure. They shape it politically. Here we have uh, PISA in the bottom right. At the top right, we have the kinds of graphs and scales in the UK by which a head teacher will live or die. Literally. If not die, literally, but lose their job. <laughs> it's almost as bad. Uh, I'm the chair of governors at my local primary school. If a head teacher's graphs are not right very, very quickly, they lose their job. It's the sort of, uh, you know, we look to Finland with envy. Um, and these analytics are highly political. And when you look at the work that goes on that examines how is PISA designed, what is the rationale, what kinds of decisions and compromises are made in PISA, it's highly political. It's highly political. Analytics shape education ontologically. What can we talk about with this representation? So on the right here, you see very different representations that are focused on the top left at exam results. Um, 
Uh, on the right, they're looking at your verbal or linguistic ability. Bottom left, they're looking at lifelong learning dispositions. I'll tell you a bit more about those. On the bottom right, we're looking at the, co the kinds of contributions people are making in conversations. They are talking about very different kinds of behaviors uh, with uh, very different kinds of learning. And so, you know, it's, it's kind of obvious, but when you choose a data model, you're choosing not to talk about other things. The worry is you're missing out some important things. And the brilliant work by Jeff Bowker and Lee Starr uh, on classification systems is, is relevant here. Classification systems provide a warrant and a tool for forgetting what to forget and how to forget it. The argument comes down to asking not only what gets coded in, but what gets coded out of a given scheme. So a very critical stance on how standards are developed and how those standards then embed into our infrastructures and become invisible, but make possible certain kinds of things and make other things very hard to do because you can't justify them. Here's a visualization from the Raise Online report that all schools get. Um, and it shows, you can see the key on the right there, who's stuck, who's falling behind, who's slow moving, who's making good progress in the different color codes. And um, you, know, you want as much light blue as possible. Um, that's, that's great, nice visualization if you're trying to track your grades. But for those of us who work with children who have all sorts of complicated things going on in their lives, a student might be making huge progress. We have children who we're just happy to see roll up at school in the morning, in uniform, having had breakfast, and don't destroy the classroom that day. Right? If we see progress in those terms in the course of a, uh, of a year, that's huge progress. We are creating a citizen who might actually make a contribution one day, who actually trusts adults. All right? That child is invisible in that scheme, of course, because that scheme does not care about those things. And so we might be asking, what kinds of analytics would evidence the progress that this child has made, even as he wrestles with goodness knows what at home? According to this, he's simply falling behind and somebody needs to fix it quickly. So a key modeling issue in the world of uh, data and analytics is the unit of analysis you choose. And there isn't time to go into detail on this, but two examples are discourse analysis. So when you sit a human being down and ask them to analyze what went on in a conversation, um, they may read the conversation very differently from a machine. Okay, And um, very interesting work by Caroline Rosé um, at, at, at CMU and, and, and many others about the differences between teaching a machine to read a transcript and how a human reads it. Another example is, uh, as we shift from focusing solely on individual learners to what a group can accomplish together, which is increasingly the world that we're moving into. Then how do we shift, how do we evidence the shift that's happened in the group's ability to construct knowledge? And so some really interesting work by uh, Bodong Chen from um, OISI in Toronto, now Minnesota, um, analyzing how you could analyze the knowledge building forums that they have using the knowledge forum tool and evidence shifts in the language that's being used or look at the patterns that seem to contribute most. Again, these slides will be up later. You can get the references for that. How do analytics shape education? Algorithmically. You're writing code with rules, with thresholds, which are looking for certain kinds of relationships and patterns. Um, it, the algorithms might even make a recommendation. Uh, Amazon is constantly trying to tell you what the next book, DVD, or microwave you should buy is based on the picture they're building up of your preferences. All right? uh, and in, in, in some forms of analytics, the recommendation engine is trying to figure out where you're at, where you're trying to get to, what you've mastered, what you haven't. But buried in those algorithms are all sorts of assumptions. And so there's a very fruitful conversation to have between the people who write these and uh, learning scientists and educators who might have a view about what's being formalized in code. Governingalgorithms.org, fascinating conference on 
on, on this very exact question. Asking the question, what then do we talk about when we talk about governing algorithms? They were, wor they were worried about algorithms in society, but also how we govern algorithms, how we stay in control of the algorithms that are just pervading our lives. And of course, the same, we might insert governing learning analytics algorithms in there. And the conference there talked about whether we're, uh, you know, a whole bunch of fascinating things. There's a great pr uh, provocation paper there, which talks about some of these topics which I'm putting up here around the inscrutability of algorithms, around um, where the agency lies, um, around what kinds of norms are we building in. So I definitely encourage you to, get, to take a look at that paper if this is of interest to you. So again, there's a conversation going on way outside of just learning, but it's very germane to the impact of this technology into education. One possible approach to take is, well, let's make sure at least that the algorithms are not in black boxes, but are open source. And there was a recent summit held um, around open learning analytics uh, between Solar and the Aperio Foundation. And you can find that on the Solar website. More on that later. How do analytics shape education semiotically? Um, we have to represent what's going on in a visual way somehow for a human to consume whether that human is the learner or the educator. And so a huge amount of interpretation is going to go on around all these sexy graphics. How do you read and write these things with integrity? How do you design the visualization so it draws attention, because that's what a visualization does, it draws your attention to certain things that somebody considered important and hides other things. Uh, and so the kind of educational development that needs to go on for, for teachers is significant here. When this thing pops up, what are you looking for? Uh, what are the patterns that you should, be, should be leaping out at you? Analytics shape education because they could change the whole dynamics of the system. This is a sort of one of the really, I think, deep possibilities. We have at the bottom the researchers, the educators, all the people who think about learning, and they form some kind of learning design intent, which they hope will have some outcome which they try and engineer in a particular way. What analytics do is they accelerate the feedback loop. Now it becomes possible to see much, much faster, am I having the desired outcomes that I hoped for? Okay? And as the, the arrow at the top suggests, it might also be feeding straight back to the learner as well, a very sort of rapid feedback. And so this changes the way we do educational research. It, um, and shifts us from an intervention of some sort, and we're not quite sure whether it has, this, has the desired effects for months to come, perhaps, until we've analyzed all the data. For the first time, the tools for analyzing the data and visualizing the results are out of the hands of researchers and becoming available, embedded in the platforms, for the people who actually constitute the system we're studying. No longer is it only the researcher who gets to study the system. The whole system is becoming more sentient, which is a very exciting idea. It's what's transformed many, many other sectors in society. Which then raises the question around who has the authority to interpret? Who has the authority indeed to define what these analytics are? Who are the stakeholders in the loop? Down at the bottom here, who gets to see the big picture? Should all students be able to see what all students are doing? Would that have interesting and effective pedagogical impacts? Or should that just be an educator or somebody special? And so the idea that students might even co-design analytics. Imagine the conversation you would have with students if we said, what do you think great performance is going to look like in this assignment? How are we going to measure that? And the idea that students become co-participants and designers of the analytics that they're going to be judged by could be very powerful pedagogically. It's like asking students to teach their peers. To think through how they're going to do that, they really have to get to grips with the material. In a paper that we, uh, um, is, is, there's an e-print out for it now, and an earlier version was in the Learning Analytics Conference. Um, we talk about the golden triangle, nothing new here. Epistemology, assessment, and pedagogy are, are, are not new concepts. Um, the point is that analytics can be used to accomplish many different kinds of pedagogical approaches. And in this paper, we talk about different kinds of analytics for different kinds of approaches. But the point is that 
in the technology and in the way it's used, you are making commitments around that triangle. Uh, let's not pretend that it's anything else. That's what makes learning analytics exciting because it's in the middle space of these plus the power of computational technology. And one example we give is of in Denmark where they've allowed high school students to use the internet during exams. It's banned in most countries. But that comes with an epistemological commitment not to simply regurgitating the facts, but to going out there, exploring, sifting information, and making sense of material and showing that you can do that in a critical way. That's a different notion of knowledge and what it means to know and how to evidence it. And when we think about actually implementing an analytics program, um, all of those then sort of come together. So here's uh, a nice simple diagram from Doug Clow at the OU. Um, we have learners, we gather data about them, we, we devise some metric to try and figure out if uh, some behavioral patterns that we're interested in, and then we try and make sense of it and make an intervention. But as we go around that cycle, we find that decisions are being made of a very important kind. What kinds of learners and what kinds of learning do we care about? What data can we actually capture digitally? How is that going to be cleaned? Are we going to strip out important contextual details? Do you have a theory of learning that you're actually going from here? Does it predict certain kinds of patterns that, you, that you're going to pay attention to and look for? If you're looking for those patterns in the data, do you actually have a technique for extracting those from the text or from the numbers uh, or from even, as we said, the posture of people when they're out there examining those trees? And how are we going to make those analytics visible? Who's going to read them? And are they, are they equipped to actually make sense of them? And then is a human and or software going to make some kind of intervention from that? So you can see this whole analytic cycle is infused with human judgments and values. That dashboard does not spring to life on its own. Data does not speak for itself. It's a ridiculous concept, but the hype around data and objectivity and algorithms suggests otherwise. So analytics profoundly shape education in all, the, all of those respects. Let's think about what kinds of learning we're trying to optimize this system for. Livingston in 41. We're not trying to just see how much knowledge students leave school with or graduates leave university with. We're looking at their appetite to know and their capacity to learn. And that was in 1941. I don't think the terms lifelong learning or 21st century skills were in currency at the time. John Seeley Brown. We're looking at the profiles of what it means to be effective in the 21st century. Resilience will be the defining concept. When challenged and bent, you learn and bounce back stronger. Dispositions are now at least as important as knowledge and skills. These can't be taught, but they can be cultivated. Larry Rosenstock from High Tech High in San Diego, amazing guy. It's more than knowledge and skills. For the innovation economy, dispositions come into play. The readiness to collaborate, the attention to multiple perspectives, initiative, your persistence, your curiosity. Carol Dweck, her well-known work around mindsets. Are you the kind of person who's scared to be shown not to know the correct answer? who doesn't want to be taken out of their comfort zone? Or are you actually relishing the chance to be stretched and challenged? Are you the kind of leader who surrounds yourself with people who will challenge and help you grow? Because we all know leaders who are scared to be found not having the right answers and who are scared to be taken out of their comfort zones as well. This isn't just children and students we're talking about. Very interesting work by Tony Bright at the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching. So he's picked up on this notion of persistence or resilience. And they have been trying to reduce a very complex literature to a set of very practical intervention measures that educators can take. 
mapping the literature and resolving it down into what they call a driver diagram. Okay? So that's, that's interesting in and of its own right. It, it, it models, I think, the transition that needs to happen where academics translate their work into practical terms for practitioners and practitioners are open to and ready to engage with the research evidence base. But that's also interesting because that provides us with a research-based rationale for architecting analytics. If you could invent analytics that tuned in to these different drivers, you've got the basis for architecting a learning analytics environment grounded in theory as opposed to just what a technologist could invent. Just one striking example of one of those, quotes, non-cognitive factors that impacts outcomes. So Bryke has shown that just having a sense of belonging in the learning community is the most powerful predictor of dropout in remedial maths in the programs he's been running especially, as you can see, amongst black students, but it applies to all students as well. If they felt, maybe I don't belong here in this maths class, and, and they, they responded to that question strongly, highly predictive later on of, of a failure to complete the course. Another discourse that's going on, both in schools but in university, that's what this, this site shows you, the reinvent university for the whole person a series of roundtables hosted by Randy Bass at um, Georgetown University. Fascinating set of conversations about how do we create university which values the whole person uh, and goes beyond just an obsession with grades or, um, uh, uh, and the usual measures. Uh, so a very, a very full vision there. Let me flash a few examples, finally, of... Um, the kinds of analytics that I'm working on and, and others are, which I feel is trying to get at some of the, the higher order qualities that we normally think of as valuable in higher education, in, even in school education as well. So one of them is about how we talk, right? Knowledge is constructed through language. How do we talk? And how do we do that for learning? So um, discourse-centric learning analytics is, is, is an umbrella term which is trying to get beneath what dashboards will currently tell you, which is simply that Simon posted 20 times in this forum, replied to uh, three other people primarily, and his average contribution post was, you know, 73 words. I mean, great, okay, at least I was engaging, but what was the quality of the contributions? So, for example, we have been trying to use language technologies to make sense of online text chat. Can we spot where the learning conversations, the quality learning exchanges might have been happening in a two and a half, half hour web, webinar? So here's a visualization of the webinar, and we train a machine to try and recognize good quality exchanges based on a theory of knowledge and discourse developed at the OU by Neil Mercer and others around exploratory talk. Karen Littleton spent some time here in Finland working around that. And... Um, at the beginning and at the end of the session, you can see the machine classified these as not being terribly profound exchanges. Blue means we didn't really think it showed exploratory talk. The length of the bar is how confident was the machine. Okay. So blue, important social niceties at the beginning and end, but there wasn't much learning conversation going on there. But if we zoom in on one of those high red peaks, the machine was confident that it was seeing some exchanges. And when we zoom in on that, you can see that it's picking up on certain kinds of ways of using language to offer ideas. I wonder if um, I take your point. Um, uh, I'd also like to point out, okay, these are ways of using language to build uh, and also to challenge and to accept new ideas as opposed to simply assert I'm right, you're wrong, um, or just assert facts, or just agree with people, which is cumulative talk, very important, but not getting to, quick, not getting to, the, to knowledge building. Or work we're doing with Xerox, who have a language parser. So they have developed a parser which looks for the rhetorical moves people make in scholarly writing. If you don't make these moves, you'll never get published, because the reviewers 
and your readership are trained to look for these moves. And this is what you're looking for in academic writing as well. Identifying an open question using constructions like little is known, da 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 da. The role of something has been elusive. Current data is insufficient to demonstrate, etc. Contrasting ideas. In contrast with previous hypotheses, da 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 da, our findings are inconsistent with. Expressing surprise of some sort. The recent discovery of blah suggests intriguing roles of the. We have recently observed, na, 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 surprisingly, da, 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 da. Okay? these are the kinds of meta discourse signals you learn to use to make your thinking visible. That's what we try and get our students to do. Make your thinking visible so that you learn what academic narrative looks like. So when we came across this, we got very, very interested. We thought, wow. Uh, we started to do some work. We gave human analysts project reports. You know, a 100-page document. Highlight what you think are the significant passages in this report. We gave it to a machine. Two seconds later, it highlights all the passages it thinks are important. When you see examples like that, it kind of blows your mind away, actually. This machine is highlighting the same passages that a trained analyst highlighted in this project report. Now, it wasn't always like this. I need to qualify this. But when you see examples like that, it's very interesting. I think they give us ex glimpses of what analytics could look like in detecting higher order thinking and writing. At the same time, of course, humans will always read a text differently from a machine. A machine will read it the same way over and over again and without flagging. A human will bring their unique perspective and background, read between the lines, etc. But what one of my students now is doing, Doigu Shimshek, uh, is, uh, is asking, can we correlate this with the kinds of values of academic writing that is well recognized in the literature? Here's a, a little extract from a piece of student writing where the parser is highlighting two sentences which it seems to think are to do with contrasting. And at the bottom where it's picked up, the student is making a summary statement of some sort. Okay? And again, we can talk about the details of this later on in the next session, but for me, this is quite fascinating. Finally, let's talk about dispositions that I talked about earlier. So dispositional learning analytics is becoming another interesting topic. There was a workshop we held at Stanford last year all around this. There are different ways of assessing dispositions. At the moment, we do observational measures, um, self-observation, self-diagnostic, teacher observation. You know, is this student showing persistence and resilience? How curious is this student? The big, the big shift is adding in the behavioral analytics. So here's a, here's a screenshot from my local school where we ask the pupils, how good are you at managing your distractions? Uh, and you can't read that, but basically they choose a scale from one to four, from I very rarely distract other people and I'm able to manage other people's distractions and I'm, I, I feel I'm quite focused, down to the bottom where you know, I know I'm, like, I'm all over the place. And they put themselves on the scale one, one to four on the right there. But people are now developing questionnaires to try and diagnose this disposition. Uh, there's one from Mindset Works. And this is one from Bristol that I work closely with called Ellie. And it asks people to think about how they approach their learning. The interesting thing about Ellie is that it, it makes the next move, it's not just a questionnaire and then the researchers analyze the data. We've done that in social science for decades. It immediately comes back with a visual analytic to the learner which they sit down and talk about with their mentor. How are you doing in relation to those seven key learning dimensions? Your curiosity, your ability to make meaning from one context to another, uh, your resilience. And this visual is intended specifically not to say, here's your personality type, deal with it. It's a malleable quality that you can work on through specific interventions. We folded this into a blogging platform, so students now 
a blogging narrative, but they're also clicking buttons to say, I feel that I'm really focusing on my resilience at the moment. There's the tortoise for resilience. There's the curious kitten. There's the chameleon that reflects that I feel that I'm changing and learning from how I would have approached this, say, two months ago. Here it is being used with master's level students as well. And here's the dashboard the teacher sees so they can get an overview of all the different inquiry projects the students are doing and they can drill down into the student's blog at any point to see why did they think that they were demonstrating their resilience at that point. And the next step, the behavioral analytics step, is could a display like this be generated not from self-report but from behavioral analytics? Could my ability to work well on my own and with colleagues be reflected in my social network patterns, uh, the way in which I initiate relationships online? Could my resilience be associated with behavioral and even somatic data? My life can be increasingly quantified through different apps, through my, my fitness band, et cetera, et cetera, about how I respond in, in situations which challenge and stress me. Could my ability to make meaning between one context and another be revealed by the way in which I tag posts? What if I tag pictures in a very different way from my peers? I'm seeing something that other people are not seeing. What if I share stuff from one community to another that no one else thought of doing? Social networks can pick that up now. Language technologies can pick up questioning and arguing behaviors, as I hope to have demonstrated, which reveal something to do with curiosity and the kinds of epistemic commitments I'm making to what counts as a justified belief. And so we're moving to the idea of a dashboard which is not scoring me, but which is giving me a reflection back of how I'm doing on some of these higher order constructs. And there's a paper that talks more detail about that. Okay, I'm not gonna have time to go through my final example, um, but I'm happy to, to talk, take questions on that. The learningemergence.net site is where we're exploring some of these ideas. I encourage you to go there. And I think that these are the big shifts that analytics are, is about to usher in. It's one about changing organizational culture to one that values evidencing what you believe is important. It's changing the academic culture, the education and learning sciences could be about to experience the same shift that genomics or theoretical physics have experienced, where the revolution that data brings means new ways of doing research. I think we may be about to see a way of evidencing many of the qualities that so many people have talked about for so long, but have been very hard to assess. I think that the practitioner culture may be about to change as well, where you are able to actually evidence whether your learning designs worked or not, and you can make more timely interventions. And there are some really interesting new opportunities opening up for research and practice, that Higher educations have now got to manage the rollout of technologies like this. That's a site for organizational learning research. We've got all the interest in creativity and curiosity that we need from our graduates, and that's meeting computational thinking and bits and bytes, and that's quite an interesting clash. We've got a real issue to do with staff professional development and leadership development. Can they engage with these representations with trust and integrity? And there's all sorts of opportunities here for pedagogical innovation as well, about how analytics may make students more self-aware and more able to regulate their own learning. So finally, if this interests you, take a look at SOLA, the Society for Learning Analytics Research. Next week in Harvard, we have the second Learning Analytics Summer Institute. You won't be able to get there, but you can join online and we have learning analytics summer institutes happening all over the world, in fact. There may be one near you, or you'll be able to join in online. Next March, come to New York for the uh, fifth learning analytics conference, where you'll hear a lot more about these kinds of things. And my conclusion, then, is that analytics unavoidably will shape education on many different dimensions, and they will perpetuate educational Worldviews. The question is, are these the worldviews that we want, that we will trust these analytics to tell us more about? 
but let's make sure it's intentional and not accidental. Thanks very much. <laughs>